Okay, everybody, welcome. Welcome. We'll continue. So, Dr. Mark, we'll let you begin at 8.31 on, uh, I know you always like to announce the date, Monday, May the 2nd, 2022, as uh, we continue our series of the rabbinic response to the rise of Reformed Judaism. Okay, Vivakasha. Yes, and I wanted to make sure that Mel was with us uh, because uh, I see he's here because uh, he pointed out something last week that I didn't know, or if I knew, I had uh, forgotten, um, that uh, I used the expression Neitzachama, which, by the way, uh, I have it here, Neitzachama is used. You have, I have a whole list here of uh, Achronim and a couple of Rishonim also who use it. Um, but uh, he pointed out that... Uh, it's not the correct, uh, not grammatically correct. And people always say Nates, Davin at Nates. Uh, and uh, I was trying to, you know, I accepted what he said and I was trying to figure out though, why wouldn't it be correct? Because Nates, meaning like the budding uh, of Hachama, the Hachama of the uh, sun. So, uh, but uh, I, my, from experience and having traveled with uh, Mel uh, and uh, emailed with him, I know that if he says something, uh, you can rely on it. You can take it to the bank. But I didn't know why I could take it to the bank yet. So uh, after the class, I, uh, I did a little searching. Uh, I Googled it. And uh, now I have the answer. Well, first, I looked at the uh, Ben Yehuda's dictionary. And I looked under Nate's, Nun. I have a PDF of the entire dictionary. It's like uh, 16 volumes. So I didn't find anything under Nun. Uh, but lo and behold, I look under Hay, and it's under, it's on page 1134, uh, and the word is Henetz, Henetz Achama. So what is this word? Well, um, I Googled it in Hebrew, and as is to be expected, I guess, um, um, Rabbi Mazuz's Yeshiva, a... Um, has a discussion on Rabbi Mazuz's yeshiva's website. Someone asked, should you say Neitzachama or Hanetzachama? And uh, the answer is given that, well, that if the hey of Hanetz is uh, just the, like I was thinking, you wouldn't have it. But that's the truth is, it's, uh, it's not, that's not the case. Uh, and uh, they point out um, it's part of the, the, the word. Um, this is in uh, Shira Shirim. Um, uh, chapter 6, verse 11, you see it here. Hey, Neitsu Harimoni. And um, the, the pomegranates were in flower, but uh, th that's the root. Well, the root is actually, or either that's the root, Hey, Nun Sadi. Um, that seems to be, the, that, well, that's what Ben Yehuda has, but others say, no, the root is uh, Nun Sadi Tzadi. But uh, however you look at it, uh, Mel is absolutely correct. Uh, and, and, and this form appears in the Gemara a number of times, where it says, <laughs> Han, So, uh, I mean, right in the beginning of uh, Brachos, as I recall, and uh, numerous other places. So, indeed, uh, we shouldn't say Neitzachama, we should say Han uh, Thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, that, uh, Mel. Dr. Mark? Yes. According to that verse, the hay is a question hay. Hop well, on, okay, on. that's uh, it, it, it's a good question. It's a good question. I didn't want to focus on that because it complicates <laughs> matters. But look at the previous word. It says hafar ha hagefen, which has the wine budded. Hinetsu uh, harimonim. Now that would imply that the root is nun sadit sadi. Um, and uh, I guess this would be he, he feel. Um, but you, um, others have said that no, that it's, it's the hay has dropped off, and uh, there, there, there's no question that uh, the Talmud and other early sources only say Hanetzachama. The fact that they only say Hanetzachama shows that uh, the the Hanets, uh, you can't remove it. And um, I mean, I, I'm looking now in um, Ben Yehuda and. Uh, he thinks it's uh, it's from the he feel he needs not nun sadi sadi, but uh, whatever it is, uh, I'm not certainly not the expert in the grammar, but the experts have all agreed that uh, it is um, uh, as Mel said, it should be hanetzachama, not netzachama. That is, it's only used in this form. Let's say with the hey in front of it, even if you're assuming that um, uh, the it's a nun sadi sadi. 
as opposed to Hainun um, Sadi, in which the hay there is dropped off. But we have examples of the hay dropping off. Another thing I wanted to show you, because uh, someone asked a question last class. Let me pull it up here. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, so, so someone asked me, um, maybe I was a little confusing about, um, I spoke about uh, minyanim for women, where uh, the men, you'd have a male chazan, let's say reciting in the vernacular, but I, I also mentioned times in the past, I've mentioned where women uh, would lead the services. And that's correct. The two are totally separate. You had services where the men led it and services where the women led it. Now, let me show you something about the women. I know I'm uh, going out on a limb here or putting myself, making troubles for myself because uh, this then would, uh, we're talking about uh, um, women's feel groups, I guess, uh, which, uh, Women's feel groups uh, were only controversial because of the social context. Uh, the fact is that every base Yaakov, as far as I know, has a women's feel group when they dive in together. But uh, I want to show you something that comes from this book. I don't know when we're going to return to Worms again, but um, when you go to Worms, uh, you go to the cemetery, and here is a book, uh, Hebrew and German, uh, by uh, Rabbi Levison, who was the he was the, the preacher, the reverend. He was not an Orthodox rabbi, but Worms, <laughs> the Irva Aim of Israel, became a not before World War II was already a non Orthodox uh, community, if you can believe it. At least the synagogue was non Orthodox, but he was a scholar and uh, he recorded uh, the graves that uh, you could uh, make out. And there's an uh, important graves there, a mayor of Rothenberg and many others. Uh, he, he records the text of the tombstones. And one of the tombstones he records that um, I don't remember. I, I was up by Worms by myself also. I can't remember if you still can read it, but you could read it uh, when he recorded it in, I think it says 1833 or maybe 1853, uh, 1855, I think. Uh, here's the tombstone. It's for a woman. Her name is Urania. Interesting name. Uh, I don't know the origin. It's uh, he, he, he mentions uh, that it's under the, if you look in um, as he say it, uh, discussions of Gitta and Aya and the Beis Shmuel, they discuss different names, so uh, he talks about that name. So this is her grave. Uh, she dies in 1275. It first mentions that she's the daughter of the Chaver, Rav Avraham, who was Rosh HaMashorim, Tefilo Solotiferis. He's, uh, I guess, uh, the head singer of the Chazan. But then look at the next page. V'hi gam hi b'kol zimra menashi mashoreris b'piyutim. So on her uh, tombstone, and we're, this is going back 800 years, it tells us that she would sing for the women uh, different PU teams. So clearly the woman, women gathered together to recite prayers of some sort. And uh, there are other examples we have of tombstones uh, which uh, say the same thing. That is praising the women for uh, leading other women in services. And finally, I have to thank Yaakov, uh, for pointing this out. Uh, we spoke last class about the Nazir and uh, what he did on uh, Pesach. Uh, Yaakov called my attention to the Mishnah Brura by way of uh, Rabbi Shimon Eider's uh, Kitzer Hilchos uh, Pesach. This, uh, this, these works of Rabbi Shimon Eider. This is 1978. This was like this and his other works on Hanukkah, Later did on Shabbos, were really the first halachic works in English uh, in, from the yeshiva world, which and then created a genre that became very popular. You have the, some Hebrew notes, and uh, it's, I don't know if anyone uses them anymore. We have many more advanced uh, type of uh, works, but uh, this was already when I was in elementary school, uh, we were using these. And as I recall, uh, even uh, Chaim Soloveitchik in his article, Rupture and Reconstruction, and discussing uh, the turn to texts, he speaks about Rabbi Shimon Eider's uh, book as um, as really one of the first ones to deal with halacha in English. And then, of course, it's going to formulate rules for things that uh, were, you know, as he says, mimetic. I never met Rabbi Shimon Eider, but I, I saw him because when I was a, uh, I think a sophomore uh, at Brandeis University, uh, we put in maybe a junior week, no, junior, I was, I was abroad, uh, I think sophomore then, we put an Arav in. On, at Brandeis University campus. Uh, and um, 
Rabbi Eider uh, came up. Uh, he was the Rav Machshir of the year of the Nidav and Mincha with us. That's what I remember. I, I didn't speak to him. No, no, it was, I was a freshman, I think, because Rabbi Lazarus, Yaakov Lazarus was uh, the, the rabbi. He's from Framingham, Massachusetts. That's my recollection. Uh, well, if you look in uh, the, the volume, the later they published it uh, all in one, but it dealing with the Seder, uh, what I'm going to tell you is, is listen to Mishnah Burris. I guess I should have known it. Uh, again, maybe I knew it, but I forgot. But if you look on page eight, it says that if you can't eat, if you can't drink wine or grape juice, and I guess if you're a Nazir, uh, you also can't drink it, uh, you can um, drink raisin wine, which you couldn't if you're a Nazir, or Chamar Medina. So you can drink Chamar Medina for the Dalakosos. So what is Chamar Medina? He says it includes alcoholic beverages, but that you can't. It's a problem on Pesach. Uh, tea and coffee. So here you have, and you can find this in the uh, the Mishnah Bura. If you look in the Mishnah Bura, 472, some 472, number 37, he says that um, you can take Hummer Medina. And what's the definition of Hummer Medina? Here he quotes from Moshe Feinstein that uh, tea and coffee is okay. And uh, there are those who hold Coca Cola. Rabbi Tights held that Coca-Cola is okay. Others hold it. And, and with the definition of Ham Medina is often explained that if you would serve this to a um, uh, to a someone to come visit you, let's say, or, or even a dignitary, but just, just if someone comes to sit down with you, uh, would you serve them as a drink? And yes, you would serve Coke uh, to them. Uh, so I think uh, most people would assume that it's good. Okay, so uh, you want to start drinking that if you're a Nazir. Thank you, Yaakov. You can uh, drink that. Uh, okay. Let's let us pick up. Uh, we ended the uh, last class. Um, we saw Aaron Horan's retraction, uh, that he takes back everything he did. We saw, he, he said, you can't change anything in the sitter. That's the big thing. You can't change anything. That's what the uh, the, the Hamburg Basin says. You can't make any changes. And from that time to the present, we haven't, you really can't alter the sitter, at least in the Ashkenazic world. It's become problematic. And uh, whereas in earlier years, uh, we do find examples of altering the sitter. And I want to show you an example before we continue with what I want to do today. I want to show you, um, hold on a second, let me move this out of the way. Oh, 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 even before I get to that, altering the sitter, I, I, I want to show you something else, because um, I just mentioned Aaron Horan. So I, I probably should have investigated a little more about um, his uh, descendants, because uh, it was mentioned last class about the issue of the Holocaust, um, uh, trying to get back uh, stuff that was taken in the Holocaust. And uh, this this is Aaron Horan's family, uh, Ferenc Horan. He's the grandson of Aaron Horan. Now, uh, he converted to Christianity. And uh, I'm not sure why he has a whole entry in the evil encyclopedia, because uh, the Jewish uh, uh, descent ended with him. And uh, the Horans that are alive today are not the Jewish. Uh, at first, I, I saw who they were married to. So I said, well, at least they remain Jewish until today. Then they intermarried. But already uh, earlier on, uh, we see that um, uh, the, um, the grandson uh, um, in, in the grandson converted and then obviously uh, married Christian, but uh, it was a um, I important family. What I want to show you is something else this, as an example of how things uh, can change. I want to show you the Gemara here that we say every time we have a wedding. Um, no, where is the Gemara? Here it is. Okay, so we have a wedding and uh, we make a bracha. Here you see it on Katubot uh, 7b. Look at the Gemara says. Now, most of you, if you're not a rabbi, you don't pay attention. Uh, you might see something's missing there that we say. And um, I will give it away now. Um, here I'm holding my, uh, I had to do this one time in my life, so I bought it. I got it from the RCA. The Madrich, the RCA uh, life cycle Madrich. So you go on um, to the wedding uh, ceremony on page 90. And it says, let me read it to you. And you can follow along in there in the Gemara. It says, Asher Kedishanu Mitzvah, it's given al arayos, the Asar lanu, Asar Rishos, v'hi tir lanu, es anasuos lanu, ayde chubo v'kidushin. 
The Gemara, the, what does the Gemara say? The Gemara says, uh, it's forbidden for us, the those, the Arusos, that is, uh, if you only have a betrothal, it says prohibit us women who are betrothed and permit it to us those women who are married. That is, what, what this means is that once you do Nisuin, then the woman is permitted to you. But I just read you. What it doesn't say that we say the Tirlanu is an Asuasalanu that permitted us those that are married to us. Obviously, who else is it referring to? If you look at the Ron in his commentary on the Rif on the uh Bez Ahmed Bez in uh, Masachas Kasubos, Kutubot, he tells us that Rab, this is the version of the Gemara, but Rabbeinu Tam Zal Higia. Rabbeinu Tam amended this, amended our, our, our blessing. And what did he have put in? The Hitirwano Esanasuos Lanu. You have an ambiguous bracha. Uh, you could read it as saying that through this blessing, married women are now permitted to us. Any married woman. Now you're going to say, well, that's crazy. Of course, it's not referring to the other married women. It's referring to your wife. But the point is that the bracha itself is ambiguous and the bracha creates uh, a problem. If you just read it literally, why do you want to have a bracha that uh, could be better, could, could get rid of uh, the ambiguity? Because of this, Rabbeinu Tam added the word lanu after Anasuos to clarify it. Uh, you know, maybe if you didn't have the word Lanu, people could start making jokes, uh, unsneistic jokes, whatever the case may be. Rabbeinu Tom felt it was okay for him in a case like this. And we have lots of examples of this throughout history before the rise of reform, where Gedola Yisrael felt comfortable in making small changes when they thought uh, it, was, it would be helpful for whatever reason. Uh, now, because of the reform movement uh, and uh, the history uh, that they've given us, we can't do this anymore. We can't alter our prayers. We can't make any changes. We can add on maybe new prayers, but we can't, the prayers that already exist, uh, we can't start altering them for understandable reasons. Uh, we did a couple to vote of uh, Ramosha Sofer, the Hasim Sofer. The, um, as I said, there's such, such an important, such a significant figure. Uh, and he thought very, uh, you know, Minhag Yisrael to him was paramount. Uh, he says in one of his responsa uh, that uh, if someone questions Minhagim, Sarich Bedika Acharav, that is, you have to question him. You have to wonder, uh, you know, what's he about? Uh, because uh, we know that uh, if you want to subvert Judaism, you can subvert Judaism by being uh, too stringent. The, the, we already derived that lesson from Chava. It says, the uh, you, God says, uh, you can't eat from the tree. And she says, at least, uh, well, it's not clear from the text whether she said it or whether Adam says it. Uh, and then she repeats it. Uh, it all depends if you want to blame the man or blame the woman. But plenty of them want to blame the woman. And they say she's the one that says uh, to the Nachash, uh, we can't touch it either. And that then gives the opening because the Nachash can say, see, you can touch it and it doesn't bring any problems. And the rabbis derive from there that uh, call it Mosif Goreya. If you try to add on extra things that uh, you end up uh, making it, uh, creating all sorts of problems. Now, the, the fact is that often we do add. I mean, what are you going to say? You're going to say that uh, all the rabbinic decrees, you could also say kolomosif gorea, but uh, I guess it depends in the context and who is doing the mosif in uh, as to whether it's, uh, we're, we're not supposed to be adding on, I guess, uh, because it could create problems. And therefore, if someone's questioning Minagay Yisrael, Sarech Badika Acharav, and as we saw last week already, the Hasim Sofer is defending uh, lenient practices in the face of uh, Chumras, and he uses Chadash Asim in the Torah to do that. There is one other letter, which I want to show you, because it really, uh, it's an important issue that begins in the days of the Chasm Sofer, actually it begins before the Chasm Sofer, but he raises it, and it creates a big machokas that I, I dare say continues uh, to this day, and it also gets to the issue of truth-telling in Halacha. That's always a big issue. Uh, if you look at my book, Changing the Immutable, the last chapter, a very long chapter there that deals with truth. Is truth a value? When can you depart from truth? The Gemara already speaks about when you can depart from truth. Uh, 
can you say it, a bride, she's beautiful. If she's not, uh, the, we hold like they say, well, you can. And there's all sorts of reasons you can depart from truth telling. Uh, so what about in halachic matters? Well, this comes to the fore in a famous dispute between Ramosha Sofer, the Hasim Sofer, and Ratzi Hirschayas. Ratzi Hirschayas, um, 1805 to 1855, uh, a traditional rav in, um, in Eastern Europe, in Zolkiev, uh, but also a Moscow. Um, if you look at his notes in the back of the Gemara, you can see that uh, he is not like a traditional rabbi. He's interested in all these historical things. You look at his writings. His introduction to the Talmud, which I highly recommend, which was uh, translated by Jacob Schachter, who was the rabbi in Belfast, Ireland, then moves to um, Eretz Yisrael. Jacob Schachter, who I knew, and he published a couple books. So he's a, he's a bit, bit of a Hebraist. He's a traditional Talmud Chacham. He translated Sirish Chayas's introduction to the Talmud. It's worth, everyone, it's worth seeing for everyone. He, it's his picture. He's the one that... Um, is his picture is the one in fact let me since i'm speaking about him i might as well pull it up now that uh, everyone thought for so long was well, not for so long for the last couple of years that uh, he was um rav yisrael salanter i'm going to show you the picture of him so um we don't have a picture of yisrael salanter we don't know where yisrael salanter looks like but uh i'm going to show you now the uh the picture of this um Rabbi Rav Chashava, you know, Talmud Chacham, nice rabbi, but not, I won't call him one of the Gedol Yisrael. For some reason, um, he becomes, and, and um, I mean, this, this, you didn't need Schneider Lyman to uh, point this out, although he had a Sfarian blog post just uh, uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago who pointed it out, but here it is. Uh, here is the picture. Again, someone already going back to 2011 who was identified incorrectly. And then uh, Daryl Wine, unfortunately, in his book includes it. This is not Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. This is uh, none other than Rabbi Jacob Schachter, the Rav of Belfast, Ireland, who uh, wrote some interesting things. And also uh, you can read, uh, here he is, he wrote this book. And he includes his picture in the book, the Hebrew book, the title page, and also the English volume. Uh, <laughs> It's a little embarrassing because uh, Rabbi Wine in his interview uh, with Art Scroll says that you can look at this picture and you could see Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, you could see the Musa personality, you could see you could see the greatness of the man. Well, maybe you could see the greatness of the man, but it, it's not Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. It's uh, it's totally someone totally different. But if you've convinced that, that shows me that if you've convinced yourself, as Rabbi Wine had, that this was Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, then it's um, he's seeing in. Jacob Schachter, who again is a fine Jew, but uh, he's not one of the Gedol Yisrael. Uh, but uh, he looks like uh, he looks like Shomer Shabbos. He looks like a fine Jew, very yeah, indeed. Uh, um, so I highly recommend everyone to read Ritzir Shlaiyus's introduction to the Talmud. Now, the issue that they were having a dispute about is the same issue we began this uh, course. Remember, delayed burial which we spoke about, uh, the dispute between Rebecca Vemden and uh, Mendelssohn, and how uh, Mendelssohn, Yaakov Emden says you can't ever delay burial because of some uh, far-fetched uh, suffix that maybe the person's still alive. Although I saw in the Drudge Report today, it's probably still on there, that they were burying a woman in Peru, and you have a video of this, you have a video right afterwards, and she starts banging on the coffin. It just happened yesterday. You don't have the video of her banging on the coffin, but you have the video as soon as they open it up. And, uh, you know, so they, they thought she was dead. She was hit, I think, in that car or something. And they, they quickly, they, they, they put her in a coffin and they're about to bury her and she's banging on the coffin. It, it's a true case. And like I said, I saw it this morning on the Drudge Report. Uh, but, um, and, and Mendelssohn thought that it was a good idea to, um, you know, keep the, the body on ice for a few days. Uh, well, um, this um, this didn't end with Mendelssohn and Rebecca Vemden. Uh, it continued to be an issue, and reform-minded Jews continued with this practice that we don't bury immediately. We leave it out for a few days, and uh, it was in response to uh, this that the Chassam Sofer takes these reformist tendencies. The Chassam Sofer takes a very strong stand, affirming what Yaakov Emden says. Uh, he, he quotes Rav Yaakov Emden, and that you need to, I think it, I think he, if I recall correctly, he even there, that's where one of the places where he refers to Mendelssohn as um, Chacham Moshe 
I mean, yes, I think so. I, I'm not 100% sure if they're, he mentions him in his ethical will, which uh, was referred to last class, and, but I think there as well. Um, and he expressed this view that uh, this, that we have to bury immediately. We're not concerned, like the Rebecca Lennon said, with far-fetched Sveikot uh, in a letter to Rav Tzvi Hershchayas. We see that Rav Tzvi Hershchayas was sympathetic to the Mendelssohnian position, that uh, now that modern medicine is uh, telling us that uh, people might not really be dead, he thought that there's no reason why not to delay burial. Uh, as uh, someone with, with Haskala tendencies and um, someone very interested in modern science, uh, if this is true, why not? Just like Mitzitsa. Why is it that we don't do Mitzitsa the at least uh, in our, most of our communities? Because the med medical science tells us that uh, it could spread disease, and uh, that's the only reason. Um, and uh, at least in, in the Litvish community, it wasn't an issue, and the German communities, uh, because uh, we have the facts that uh, diseases could be spread. Ritzvi Hirschchayas is put in his place, I guess you could say, by the Chasm Sofer. In fact, if you look in the Chubas of the Chasm Sofer, it does not even reveal who the letter is written to. And that is no doubt because when the Chuba was published posthumously, uh, the children of the Chasm Sofer, um, knowing that Ritzvi Hirschchayas, he's problematic in certain circles because of his uh, Haskalah sympathies, they let they did not include the uh, the name of the recipient, but we know the name of the recipient because Tzvi uh, Yishchayas himself, in his collected writings, uh, he includes it, and uh, he includes other things we'll see right now as well. Now, in his letter to Tzvi Yishchayas, Tzvi Yishchayas, you can, two more, a couple more things about him. There's a very nice Hebrew biography of him by Meir Hershkovitz. Uh, late uh, Rabbi Dr. Mayor Hershkowitz, published from Masada of Cook. Uh, he has everything imaginable ever written by and about Ritzir Shlias. But if you, and it's full of fascinating sources, but if you really want insight into Ritzir Shlias, and if you really want to come away seeing him as more of a Moscow than a traditional Talmudist, I have to recommend Bruya Hutner David's Columbia University doctoral dissertation. That's Rev Hutner, of Isaac Hutner's daughters. She went to Columbia. The women, of course, as we know, always were able to get advanced uh, education. She didn't just get an advanced education. She got a PhD and she wrote an unbelievably good doctoral dissertation on Ritzvi Hirschchayas. I asked uh, Yaakov Elman, the late Rabbi, Yaakov, Rabbi Dr. Yaakov Elman once, um, because the, the dissertation is not very respectful. You don't come away with such good uh, feelings about Ritzvi Hirschchayas. Um, you see him as one of these people who was really caught between two worlds. And I asked Yaakov Elman, uh, would her father have approved of this? And he told me yes. Uh, apparently he knew that uh, Rav Hutner was no fan of Rav Tzvi uh, The Belzer Hasidim, I think it's the Belzers, they tear out Rav Tzvi uh, commentary in the back, or at least that's what I've been told. But uh, look, he's uh, he's uh, he's one of Argadol Yisrael. He could be, uh, he, so he's a bit of a modern Orthodox type. He's not the only one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have a number of them, and um, he, he's a very important figure. But uh, the, I have Barry Hunter David's uh, dissertation. If anyone wants, I could send it to you. I think I have a PDF. Many of you have been writing me for PDFs. I believe I have a PDF of that as well. So in his letter, in the Chassam Sofer's letter to uh, Maritz Chayas, he says that if you don't bury immediately, you violate two Torah commandments, a positive commandment to bury immediately, and a negative one not to leave out. Ritzi Yishchayas replies to the Chasm Sofer and says that he's mistaken in this assumption. There's only one uh, prohibition that you violate, namely uh, the negative prohibition. To this, the Chasm Sofer replies again to um, Ritzi Yishchayas, and this is what I want to show you. It's, you can see it in, um, uh, this is in the collected writings of uh, the volume Dar Ha'ara, the collected writings of Ritzi Yishchayas, and this is the second letter that um, he received from uh, the Chassam Sofer. And the Chassam Sofer begins by saying, I, I received your letter when Shab Shabbos is starting, but so now I'm writing back to you. Um, I'm writing, um, he, 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 you see, he says, I'm writing about, uh, talk about what I said, Chodesh Hashem in the Torah. 
So we see already again, he likes that expression. He's using it. He says, I didn't say Orla and Kilayim, but Chadash. Why? Because uh, we have to go by uh, the, um, the people who've established the Torah. We can't open up uh, new things because if you open up a little bit, a crack as fine as a needle, that's the expression he used, is you for two parrots up and eight parrots. That is, you give a little bit, everything's going to open up. And uh, the reformers will take a little bit and they'll uh, they'll run with it. Uh, so we have to chadash us b'tura. We can't. What, what's the chadash here? The chadash here is uh, getting rid of immediate burial. And then he says, uh, look in uh, the in the hagos maimonios, the chuvas maimon, the chuvas there, in hilchos uh, smachos. He says al davar kal b'sa isha b'toch shlosh regolim shemes ishto. There's a um, according to halacha. If let's say you haven't fulfilled pru or vu, you're allowed to remarry before uh, before a year, before the three holidays. Or if let's say you need a wife to take care of your children, but in Ashkenaz, the practice was let the three um, you know pilgrimage festivals uh, go by. And he quotes the Ghost Maimonius here that uh, he calls it a davar kal, and nevertheless uh, they were uh, stringent on this. Uh, then the Chasm Sofer says, Ani kasafte halonas mesim yeshbo ase. I said, I said that leaving, not burying the body immediately, it's an ase, analos ase. Why? And the Maritz Chaya says, that's not true. That's not what we assume. But he says, why? Ki al kopanim haramban kasaf came. Because at least the Ramban says it. So even though every all the other uh, Rishonim and the standard view is that it's only... Uh, there's only a, 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 a love, but since the Ramban says um, that there's both a positive and negative, therefore I felt comfortable in citing, in stating just as a fact that uh, you violate two things. And then he says, in nafku saladina, bizmana zaladina. He says that there's no nafkamina. It doesn't matter halachically whether it's, uh, if I say there's a love and a positive commandment, uh, and almost everyone sings is only a love. It, what's the difference? It doesn't matter. It's still a halacha. It's still a, it's still a mitzvah in the Torah. What's it matter? And then he says, the tov lahalos ha'iser. The Chassam Sofer says, I I quoted from the Ramban, even though this isn't the standard position that you violate both a love and uh, an ase. Why? Because in our day and age, tov lahalos ha'iser. It's good to raise the level of the Isser. What does this mean? It's good to raise the level of the Isser. It's good to let the people in an era when the reform is threatening us and people are looking for all sorts of new things, it's good to let them think that it's even more of an offense than it is. Uh, now, I, we're going to come back in a minute to see what Ritzvi Yashchayas uh, has to say about this. But I want to just tell you, he, he continues in his letter. He says that, um, he says that you, uh, Maritz Chayas, uh, he criticized him for relying on a, a view of the Chavos Yair that we reject. He says, in our generation, um, we can't say that something's Durabanan. Why? Because the people today say, we don't care about the rabbis. You know, it's very dangerous, he tells Ritzir Shchayas, to start saying, telling the people that this is only a rabbinic prohibition. And then he says, the no de Yehuda, the great Rebbe Chaskalando, he uh, erred in this matter. Why? Because he said that, in a, let's say you have a store and you have to keep your store open on Shabbos by, you, by a non-Jew running it. Let's say you sell it to the non-Jew or you do it in some halakhically permissible way. Sometimes uh, you'll have to write something down. Like let's say uh, there's a delivery and um, we're talking about where there's a hector to keep have the store, but there's a delivery. So you have to write something. So he says the no to be Yehuda was so mech and a and a half said maruba. Uh, where it's a lot of loss of money, you could lose your whole livelihood, so you need to permit this. That is, there is such an opinion, he calls it a dea dechuya, a rejected opinion, that ksav galachos that's uh, the, 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 the ksav, the, uh, the writing of the, the, the priest, that is a Latin, non-Hebraic writing. That's what they refer to, let's say, in the vernacular. That it's not media so Since it's not media 
it's only midrabanan, so it's a shus, it's a uh, it's a shasad chak. You can do that, and then listen what the Chasam Sofer says. It's right over here where it says ulam. He says ulam, the mechilas kavodo. All due respect to uh, the note of Behuda, hekar ambati or ambatia. He has he's um, made cool the um, the, um, the, the 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 pool. What's he referring to there? He's refer- I'll show you what he's referring to. He's referring to, um, you know it from Rashi, but it's a Gemara. It's in Parshas Kiseitze. It says, Asher Karcha Baderach. It's um, uh, how um, Amalek uh, came upon you on, on, on the rear. So what is this word Karcha? So Rashi gives a few explanations. And one of his explanation is, he thinks the word Karcha, he says, um, it's from the word Kor. He cooled you off and made you appear tepid. That is, once I'm, people were afraid of B'nai Yisrael, but once Amalek comes in and uh, fights, then they f- come in. And what does Rashi say? Moshe Lambate, you know, it's like a, um, that it's like, what does it say? A bathtub of boiling water. Um, but once, but once uh, Amalek does it, then everyone feels they can jump in. And that's the exact same thing here. He says that, uh, He says that once you uh, tell them that it's only Durabonan, you're now lessening the sin. You're saying that writing is not a Doraisa, it's only Durabonan. Now you've lessened it, and everyone can jump in. And then he says, the Harashaim Kosi Bashabas, Adashu Durabonan. There is Rashaim, they say, well, it's only Durabonan. The note of Yehuda, he's lessened the stringency. So now they all jump in. They're not concerned with the Rabbana of these people. Now, listen, he's talking about people who apparently were not, at, if it's Daraisa, they'd be concerned. We're not at the stage now where what we're going to see soon, the next generation, where they don't care about Daraisa also. We're talking about, and I heard this growing up, you hear this in very liberal, modern Orthodox section, when they, they ask what halacha, where is that halacha, where does that come from? And you see the rabbis and people will say, well, I don't, you know, if you told me it's a Torah, it's one thing. The rabbis, you know, so uh, you tell someone why they can't go swimming, let's say in a pool, you know, you build a boat or things like that. Do they hear what the rabbis, so, so the ones he's calling Rashaim are like, you know, very liberal, modern Orthodox, who uh, if it's the rabbis, that, that, that I can be lenient. Uh, and there is such a phenomenon of people who are serious when it comes to the Torah, but uh, the rabbis, they're not so uh, serious about. And he says, uh, it said, he said, it says in an avos, the, the sages, you need to be careful with your words because uh, you could say something and it can lead to all sorts of uh, bad results. He says, And many have already drunk. What is he referring to? He's referring to in Pergavos, it says as follows. Avtalion says, You have to be careful. Take heed with your words. Because lest you incur the punishment of exile. You'll be sent away to the place of evil waters. And the, um, the students that come after will drink of it and die. What this means is that um, you're going to, uh, through what you say, um, well, the place of evil waters is heresy. You're going to end up in a place of heresy, and or maybe it refers to Alexandria. There's all different opinions. But the, what, what he's saying is obvious that... Um, Oh, I want to get back to the screen. Now that um, you're going to be responsible as a rav if you say them, if you give a heter without understanding the implications, and not just if you give a heter, if you say that uh, it's only rabbinic, um, it can lead to all sorts of problems. Um, this notion that we saw, I want to go back now. The Chassam Sofer says, Tov um, halos Oh, here it is at the top. This has been seen by Yaakov Katz, by Moshe Samet, as a, as a crucial element of the Hassan Sofer's approach. They, they both stress this in discussing the Hassan Sofer's battle with reform, that we raise the level of the Isser. I want to show you, oh, hold on a second. Uh, to, uh, get the, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's go back to the Hassan Sofer. I want to show you though what the Maritz Chayas has to say about this. He says in his note, on 
Chassam Sofer's point, Tova Halosasa Isser, he says, in my opinion, Mudati, Lo Nachon, Beinai Hachata de Mutava Sasa Isser. He says, in my opinion, it is incorrect to say that you can raise the level of an Isser. The Lomaro Isser Lota Se Greda, and to say about a Lota Se, Shehub Ase the Lota Se. To tell people that even though it's a lota say, it's a lota say and an ase. And then he continues, he says, even though we see that uh, the sages, the Chassam Umar Chayas says, uh, would exaggerate. We know that the rabbis exaggerated. The Rambam already says that. So, um, and he brings some example here, right? And we see exaggerations, negative and positive. They say this is the worst sin in the world. They say, if you observe this mitzvah, it's like all 613 uh, uh, mitzvot. Um, he says, that, he quotes the Rambam as saying, they did this, they did this to uh, instill upon people how significant it was. Uh, and uh, so it says, and there's things where they say that you're Chayav Misa, and it's like you worshiped idolatry. That we know already, that the rabbis would say, it's like you worshiped idolatry, or it's like you fulfilled all the mitzvot, or it's like you violated the whole Torah, things like that. But then he says, that's, these are just iyumi mohafri. These are just ways of, um, you know, threatening people, instilling on them fear, not to violate it. But if you're going to tell me that an isra durabonon is an isra Torah, the Rambam says, in Olas Mamrim, that you violated Baal Tosif. If you say to someone that a, a rabbinic commandment is a Torah commandment, you violated uh, Baal Tosif, which is a Torah commandment you, you're violating. And then you can't say it's Asur Minat Torah. Then he says it's also Midvar Shakatircha. You're violating the Torah, says to keep far from a false matter, even though you're doing it for a reason. And he, and he ends, the Marat Chayis ends, the Chazal, Diktaku Bechol Eis Lamod Al Beror, Eis Ainyan Midivari Torah, Eis Midivari Sofrim, Abakom Dek and Afkim Miladina. He says that Chazal were always very careful to determine. And to let us know when it's uh, deraisa, when it's derabana, and really it has no significant, no mean, no no real difference. We have to follow all of them, and yet the rabbis were very careful to let us know. Okay, very strong response to Chasam Shofer, but my only my, my response to Maritz Chayis is, you said Maritz Chayis that um, it's usher to say about an iser derabana and that it's an iser Torah. Where does the Chasam Shofer say that? He doesn't say that at all. The Chassam Sofer never says that, uh, he says, Tovo Isar. And he's talking about a case where there's a, um, where most assume that it's only a negative commandment, and the Ramban says it's a positive and a negative commandment. And then he says that uh, in that case, since at least the Ramban says that it's Tovo Halosasa Isar. But where does, and then he speaks about how um, you can't, uh, you should not rely on, um, uh, these uh, re rejected views, I guess you would say, that uh, uh, that hold that, uh, say, certain things about Shabbos are only Durabanan, because that will lead people to reject it. And if and certainly don't say publicly that it's only a rabbinic prohibition, even if you think so. But where does the Chasm Sofer say here that Tova Halosasa Isra means that you take a rabbinic prohibition and you are Halosata Isra, you increase that and say, help people, it's Torah prohibition. He doesn't say it anywhere. The Chassam Sofer, the Maritz Chayis is wrong. He, as far as I can see, uh, he's uh, accusing the Chassam Sofer of saying something which the Chassam Sofer doesn't say. But yes, the Chassam Sofer says to raise the level of an Isser, it's good to do. But that doesn't mean he's saying that we take a rabbinic prohibition. And since people don't listen to the rabbinic prohibition, tell them it's a Torah prohibition. It's true that he continues. The, the Chassam Sofer, and he talks about how the people, uh, they don't pay attention to, but he doesn't say, therefore, tell them it's a Torah prohibition. What he's saying is that the Nod Yehuda shouldn't have um, come out with a heter based on the fact that Amiro, that, that uh, non-Jewish writing is, uh, is Durabanan. And in general, you don't need to tell them about every rabbinic prohibition, it's only a rabbinic prohibition. But that's not the same thing as telling, that, that means you're not telling them that it's a rabbinic prohibition. But that's not the same thing as actually telling them it's a Torah prohibition when it's only rabbinic. So I, uh, I have no doubt here that the, um, that, uh, the Maritz Lais is uh, 
is mistaken in this matter. Uh, because look, if the, the Chassam Sofer thought that that was acceptable, he wouldn't, if the Chassam Sofer thought it was acceptable to tell people, and we're going to see that there are Acharonim who do think it's acceptable, but not the Chassam Sofer. If the Chassam Sofer thought it was acceptable to say that it's a Torah prohibition, when it's only rabbinic prohibition, then he would have said so. Why does he need to cite the Ramban? He's telling you that the only reason I'm saying that it's a Torah, that it's a, uh, a, a, an Asay and a Lotase is because, um, you know, the Ramban says so. But wait a second, if the whole idea, if you're allowed to misrepresent the Torah in order to get people to follow it, then I don't need the Ramban. I can just tell them, every, I can just say you violate two prohibitions. Um, that to me is obvious. However, even if the Chassam Sofer and what I'm saying, my interpretation of the Chazam Sofer is, I'm saying it's not, I mean, that, I've read it and I assume that this first time I read it, but subsequently when I was investigating it, uh, that, that's the standard understanding of the Chazam Sofer. The, the, the standard understanding is what I just said. And the assumption is that the Maharaj Chais is incorrect. But even if the Maharaj Chais is incorrect in attributing this to the Chazam Sofer, there were others who held this position. That the Chassam so that the Maritz Chayes attributes to the Chassam Sofer, namely that you can take a rabbinic prohibition and you can tell the masses, the Hamonam, that it's a Torah prohibition. Because at the end of the day, why do the Hamonam need to know the truth? There's no nafkamina. If the job of a rabbi is to keep the people uh, observant, uh, if he knows that the uh, the people are not going to listen, if they know it's rabbinic and they tell and they ask him, is it rabbinic or not? He can tell them, no, it's a Torah prohibition. Or if he thinks just by announcing it, it's going to help matters. This leads to a fundamental dispute that I wrote about in Changing the Immutable. You can find it on Amazon, those who are interested. My other two books from Whitman, uh, Limits of Orthodox Theology and uh, Between the Yeshiva and Modern Orthodoxy, for months, for some reason, we couldn't get them on Amazon. They, they just, uh, just these third-party sellers. But Baruch Hashem, last week, they're now available on Amazon. And so anyone who wants to buy, uh, feel free. So I speak in Changing the Immutable this view that uh, you can um, tell people it's a Torah prohibition when it's only rabbinic in opposition to the Maharaj Chayas, and they don't think it's a, uh, it's a problem. Um, and this has great contemporary relevance. I mentioned last week, because uh, the, the Frimmer brothers, they, they wrote a whole long essay in tradition on women's prayer groups. And uh, they dealt with like statements like them from the Wai Rosh Yeshiva, that it's us, sir. So they have a whole appendix there saying, because many people suspected when they said it's us, sir, they didn't, it's not really us, sir, like you can point to a source, it's us, sir, it's us, sir, because they feel it's going to lead to uh, bad, bad things, bad results. Uh, much like maybe it's uh, not technically us, sir, to pray in the vernacular, but we know where it's going to lead to. Uh, so the Frimmers have a whole appendix there. Can you misrepresent the Torah for positive uh, goals? And they show that this is a huge dispute with big authorities on both sides of the issue. Uh, for, you, for public policy, can you uh, say that something's forbidden and even forbidden from the Torah if it's not really? They conclude that the consensus of codifiers uh, maintain that public policy considerations doesn't entitle you to make a service in halakha. But I, I don't think that's true. I think from the very sources they cite, uh, there's no consensus. I think it, it's a dispute and it remains a dispute. Uh, I mean, just to give you some examples, none other than, forget the Rashba, I mean, he's great enough, but in our own day, Ravad Yosef and Chaim Kanievsky both state that it's permissible to misrepresent the reason or the source of a prohibition. And the Frimmers cite sources that do hold you can upgrade, in quotes, a biblical uh, rabbinic prohibition to a biblical one, which is how Maritz Chayas understood the Chassan Sofer. So, um, I, uh, uh, this is a, this is a dispute, and, um, there's plenty of authorities that say to uh, oppose it. And Rafaim David Levi, actually, he was chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. He says the whole dispute is irrelevant today because today, uh, if you lie to your community, it'll get out. People, this is before the internet, he said this. Uh, he died before there was an internet. He died, I think, in 98. Uh, but he said that um, if you tell your congregants something, they're going to find out the truth. Uh, and then they're going to lose respect for you. So in our day and age, you have to be honest with them. But uh, there is a trend in our tradition. It doesn't mean I like it, but it's there. Uh, that uh, permits misrepresentation and even outright falsification of halacha if it serves a good purpose. That is, there's this uh, idea that uh, for the masses, they don't need to know. And uh, the elites, they know the truth. Uh, you don't find this in the... Well, you, you sort of surpass some passages 
you might be able to find sources from the Gemara. You definitely find the idea of Falach of Morin That is, you don't need to let the masses in on all the truths. Uh, Rav Shechter quotes in Nefesh Rav, or Pnine Rav, that uh, the Rav told his students that even though Kraft cheese was kosher, that's what he held, uh, because it was a vegetable rennet. And he held like the, the view in Tosos that we're not concerned that uh, basically Gvina Sakum is like Chal it's, uh, it's not a matter, it's not like Shrita, where you need the Jew to be involved. Today, we don't hold like that to none of the Kashos organizations. But he said, don't tell the Balabatim this because uh, they, they won't know how to distinguish properly. But that's not the same thing as telling them falsehoods, but we have examples. I gave a great example in my book about a rabbi, Eliyahu Rusoff, who was confronted with an unbelievable question where a um, guy was sitting Shiva and the last day of Shiva is Shabbos and he wanted to know, uh, do, do you sit Shiva on Shabbos? And the reason he wanted to know is because uh, he had a store that he would he wasn't Shomer Shabbos. So he wanted to go back to the store because his wife was running it and she was doing a terrible job. So Rabbi Rusoff says, well, if I tell him the truth, that there is no Shiva, then he's going to be Michal Shabbos. On the other hand, can I lie to him and tell him there is Shiva? Like today, this would not even be a question because anyone could open up Maurice Lamb's book or go on the internet and you know the answer to that. But he decides in the end that I'm not going to tell the truth to this person. We do a simple Jews. And he tells them, that uh, you don't, it's Shabbos, uh, so there is, you you, uh, you have to stay in the house, but uh, you, you don't, you can put on regular clothes, all that sort of thing, but you're not allowed to leave the house. So he lies to him and he tells him that there's some, um, some, some of Eos and that you have to stay in the house um, um, on the final day. Uh, because otherwise uh, the, the person's going to go to a store. After all, in, in any event, the Avelos ends, uh, you only do a tiny bit uh, the last day. But he says, and he d- defends himself, and he, exp- he goes through the whole thing. You know, what's the role of the rabbi? He speaks about Avelos, that we're responsible for everyone. You might say, why do I care what this guy does? But no, all Jews are responsible for one another, and there's cosmic significance. So we try our hardest. We don't even want Jews who are Mechal Shabbos. We try to avoid it if we can putting him in a situation uh, where there could be Mechal Shabbos. So it's a long, um, it's a long dispute. You can read about it in my book. Uh, incidentally, I, uh, in my book, I found that uh, the Me'iri says that the Talmud sometimes uh, attributes biblical authority to rabbinic, um, uh, rabbinic laws. Um, it says that the Talmud says that honoring a step-parent is, is a Torah law, even though we know it's only a rabbinic command. And uh, the Meiri explains that uh, human psychology being what it is, you can assume that step parenting in ancient times was as difficult and often thank- as thankless as it is today. So uh, well, the Meiri says that the Talmud, this statement that um, it, it's, a Torah, it's a Torah law, they were raising the prohibition, that is not, not to mistreat step parents, to encourage people to give proper respect. I, I couldn't find anyone else who says this, and therefore, I'm assuming they assume that the, all the other Rishonim think that this opinion is an outlying opinion, which we don't accept. But the Me'iri doesn't see it as an outlying opinion. The Me'iri sees it as in line with all the other opinions. But this is an example of where something is being said, al derech that is uh, no different than when the Gemara sometimes says that if you violate this, it's like you worship idolatry, or you violate the whole Torah. So here, too, they exaggerate. Uh, to uh, get people to uh, properly uh, uh, behave. Incidentally, uh, also, since I mentioned Rav Shachter, Rav Shachter in Nefesh Arav says that um, he agrees with Ritzvi Yoshchayas. Rav Chaim Soloveitchik says that, uh, and the Rav would hold this also, that to misrepresent halacha, to say that a rabbinic prohibition is biblical, he thinks that this is a violation of the Torah law, Midvar Midvar Shachar Tirchak, that the uh, that you can't uh, say a false matter. And uh, this this became a problem in Germany. I discussed this in uh, limits in um, between the yeshiva world. You had the whole problem of um, stunning before shrita. And the rabbis declared that you couldn't stun before shrita. And uh, Rabbi Moser Grzynski said that we can't give reasons. We have to just say it's absolutely forbidden. Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg thought that he could find a way to permit it. 
that with uh, the new types of stunning, um, it wouldn't uh, create I internal pr problems. But Rav Chaim Moser Grzynski prevailed on him to not publish this, and he didn't publish it until uh, the first volume of the Street of Yesh, uh, in, was it 1959, 1960, 1960? But Rav Chaim Weinberg writes how uh, people are wondering, uh, is it really prohibited? Or the rabbis, because shlita, how important it is, are just telling people it's prohibited. And uh, there were plenty of people in Germany, we know, who thought that uh, it really wasn't prohibited halakhically. Uh, and Rabbi Weinberg himself said that uh, for many of the rabbis, it had nothing to do with halacha. He said the Hasidic rebbe's immediately declared stunning forbidden. It has nothing to do with halacha. It's simply because this is the Jewish practice. And uh, so this became a big issue then as well for meta halachic reasons, uh, I guess you can call it. Uh, now, why do Rav Chaim Moser said that we can't give reasons? He says, just say it's forbidden. Not because Rav Chaim Moser definitely had halachic reasons. Uh, unlike the other rabbis, uh, the, the, the Hasidic rabbis and um, not just Hasidic, but uh, mostly Hasidic. Rav Chaim Ozer said that if we give reasons as to why, if we say that you can't stun an animal before Shlita because of this and that, then all of a sudden it becomes a matter of halacha discussion. We're giving a reason and someone else then is going to come back with another reason, taking issue with us. And then it's a machokas. And if it's a machokas, the hamonam looks and says, ah, oh, there's different opinions. Okay, I'll go with the lenient opinion. Once it's a dispute, you know that all of a sudden, then it's not an absolute sir, because it's it can't be an absolute sir because if there's rabbis disputing it, uh, it's not absolute. So Chaim Moser said, "This is one of the things that we need to. We can't give a reason. We just need to say, almost like Das Torah, that um, it, it's it's. But unlike Das Torah, it's not coming from um, the charismatic personality. They, he has the reason. Chaim Moser knows perfectly well halachically why it is, but he says we can't let the masses." Uh, have these reasons because then uh, rabbis, second level rabbis will start arguing and they'll create a problem. The only other time I know about this, and I believe it was Rav Chaim Moser said similarly with electricity on Shabbos. If I'm not mistaken, Rav Chaim Moser said, we have to simply say it's usser without explaining why it's usser. Um, if it's not Rav Chaim Moser, it might be Rav Chaim Moser, I can't remember. I think it's Rav Chaim Moser because again, if you start explaining why, then uh, it starts breaking it down. Um, so I'll leave you with this so you can think about, these are interesting questions to think about. Uh, uh, does this encourage uh, practice of halacha if you're not totally honest or, or, or the opposite? Uh, I'll say a little more about this uh, next class and then um, I think we'll uh, uh, so have some more stuff to say about the Hasim Sofer, some interesting things. And, uh, and then I'm gonna show you a, a reformist uh, text out of Lakewood, believe it or not. Something that uh, I think it'll blow you away when you see this reformist text. And maybe, maybe next class, we'll even uh, meet um, the violinist. That's what they would call them. You know who the violinist is? If you don't know who the violinist is, uh, we, shall, uh, we shall meet. If you, uh, that's the German word for violinist. Uh, I'll introduce you to that uh, individual. Uh, Gaon of learning in learning, unbelievable Gaon. Unfortunately, he went to the dark side, the, um, the, the violinist. Um, okay, hold on, we have the questions. Um, well, I was waiting to see, no one says. Anyone, we have some German speakers here. How do you say violinist in Hebrew, in German? I think you say violinistin, but it's also Geiger. Geiger is the violinist. So you know, Geiger is someone who plays the violin. So. Um, um, he's, um, I remember uh, in one of the Hebrew texts attacking him, they call him the Menagain. And they keep calling the Menagain. I mean, who's the Menagain? Who's the attacking? And finally, I figured it out that it's Geiger. Uh, um, so we'll, we'll probably meet uh, Abraham Geiger. And he is. He is. His learning is, is really beyond belief uh, how much he knew, but uh, he used it for the wrong, re wrong purposes. Okay, Ellen says, Yes, I, the truth is that um, for the um, the um, hey interrogative, it has to be a hey with a patach. However, if you look at the verse, it appears here. I'll show you the verse again. It appears. Uh, uh, hold on a second. It, let me find it here. Pull it up here. It does appear that something's missing. It says liros. Then, where's the hey interrogative? 
you'd expect a hey interrogative there. Um, that's why it's been suggested that an initial hey has dropped off. I saw that in one of the sources. And uh, others have said that no, that uh, this is just, uh, that's just the form, um, not a problem. Um, so um, let's yeah, see. Rabbi Mark. I take back what I, looking at that verse, it's from Shir Hashirim. Yeah. When you start talking about poetry, you really can't, you can't derive dictog rules from poetry because he's, he can use it for the meter. He didn't want that extra yeah. in there. But uh, so everyone's agreeing that it's, that's part of the root. Or I shouldn't say that, not everyone agrees. It's either he feel uh, or it's, uh, Ben Yehuda has it, as I said, as part of the root. Right, Evan Shoshan says it's the he feel. Yeah. Right. Um, Nun tzadi tzadi is the was the word. Yes, <clears throat> and, indeed, that's what he does. But Rabbi Mazuz's guy says it's the, the root is he agrees with Ben Yehuda. But however you look at it, we're back to the answer that, as Mel said, that it's Hanet Sachama. And really, it's the, the, the Gemara, that's what the Gemara calls it. So the only question is, is we have to figure out why the Gemara refers to it as Hanet Sachama, not Nate Sachama. But we know that it's correct because the, the Gemara refers it. Now, why it's uh, the other way has come in? Well, uh, I guess we, we can start trying to correct people. Um, Hyman says in several circles is pronounced Hennets. Well, as I said, um, hold on, I have it here. The, um, that's what, um, do I have my paper here? Um, that is exactly, yes, hen, hen, henets. That's uh, a uh, segel and a seire. That's how it's vocalized in Ben Yehuda's dictionary. Ben Yehuda gives you lots of sources of the use of it. Um, you know, Suzanne, it shouldn't be henets. It should be, um, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I think Ibn Shushan does have henets. Uh, but uh, if it's henets, then it should be a... Um, Well, if it's not, if it's, it should be, it should be a chataf patach under the hay, because we're not assuming that it's the hay. Well, that's if it's a hay, hay or, the chataf patach would be for if it's a hay sheila. But I'm thinking it's, it's like you know the the rising or the shining of the sun. No, no, but that would. Uh, oh no, no, but then uh, then you'd be correct. But then, then you no, then you. But then you wouldn't say that. You would say netzachama. Uh, you wouldn't say hanetzachama. You the way you're saying it is a verb. Uh, no, you wouldn't say. You say netzachama. Hanets. No, it would be hanetzachama because it would be a construct. Uh, the hay from the he feel. Oh well, no, but then anyway, it's not a patach then. Um, no, it would be a kamat. Um, that that's I think I believe that's what Ibn Shushan has. Uh, hold on, I think I made a note of this. Um, Ibn Shushan has a tzere, hey, No, the Ibn Shushan I have has as a comics, comics, like Susanna says, ha uh, I Ibn Shushan has hey nates in hifil. Yeah, but I mean, Ben Yehuda has hey yeah, but, um, I, Actually, I'm not reading from the, the literary Ibn Shushan, I'm reading from Atar Hasafa Ha'ivrit. When I Googled it, it came up. Uh, so the whole discussion there. But he says that uh, the Nikud should have been a Chataf Patach, uh, not, not a Kamatz. That is, Hanei Tzachama uh, should have been a Chataf Patach for Ibn Shushan. But uh, Rabbi Kelman says, Rabbi Eider first went to Wayu before Lakewood. That is correct, indeed. Uh, it's fascinating how you never see the books anymore. They were once very popular. I first started using them when I was, I had the Pesach, uh, Shabbos. I think the reason is, is because um, we've gotten better books and more detailed books. That's all. Uh, uh, but they're still very good. Um, I didn't know, Mike, that Rabbi Eider was the rough for the Upenei Rav as well. Um, in those days, I don't know how many people traveled around uh, to do Erevin. Uh, I guess he was one of them. Um, by the way, speaking of traveling around, um, Rabbi Nutta Greenblatt of Memphis passed away two days ago. Or three, two days. The funeral was yesterday. Or I think it was yesterday. Uh, I watched it online. Um, he would travel all over the whole week for Gittin issues. If you're from any of you from Memphis, you certainly know of Nutta. He was the uncle of a Refrain Greenblatt, although they're basically the same age. Uh, remember, first my first my class on my latest book, you learned a lot about uh, uh, 
uh, Rabbi Ephraim Greenblatt, but I never met uh, Rav Nata Greenblatt, unfortunately. And we also learned in the 50s, Rabbi Shimon Eider was the head lifeguard at Camp Corina. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and in charge of learning at Camp Monk. Hyman says, how about four cups of Sulvitz? So that's the kind of fashos. <laughs> they say you can't, remember the Gemara says that even if it hurts your head, you're supposed to drink it. Uh, but if you physically, if you're allergic or whatever, and a Nazir, a Nazir is, uh, he can't break his Nazirus. Uh, and Rabbi says that he uses his alachot for the footnotes. He quotes from Moshe with three. That is correct. Uh, Shimon Eider's book was significant because he went to Ramosha and he had oral psakim from Ramosha. Before this became popular in an English book to have oral psakim of Ramosha. And it says you used him as your posake. When I first became a rabbi, I always spoke about his ears at BTA and YU. I'm glad to see that they always spoke about his ears because some of these uh, people, they cover it up. They don't want anyone to know about it. It's like... Uh, I know a, a rabbi who remained nameless. He's uh, a Baal Tshuva, you know, went to Lakewood, the whole bit. Uh, he, uh, he makes believe, he doesn't, he made believe once um, that he didn't know who the Yankees were. He's a, he grew up irreligious and uh, just, uh, he, you know, uh, and that's not right because uh, it doesn't take away from it. That's who you are. That's where you came from. Uh, he asked, who are Yankees? Who are they? Uh, and, oh, come on. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, even the Satra Hasid didn't know, know who the New York Yankees are. By the way, it's 2 2 in the ninth inning, Yankees and Blue Jays. Yankees are in Toronto for a three game series. I just went to look. It's 2 2 in the top of the ninth. Okay. okay. Well, uh, oh. I don't follow you know who the Yankees are and the Blue Jays. Okay. Um, and um, Rachmiel mentions, and this is in the evil article, he mentioned married uh, into the, mar into the mar Medford Weiss family, the single wealthiest Jewish family in Hungary. Their wealth was expropriated by the Nazis. If you read the Yivo Encyclopedia, you, you can uh, see all that. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Alan, the rare Bible, you shall commit adultery. It's, there's a name for that Bible. I forget what it's called. It's a, uh, what that, that that's always, we have uh, different versions. Look at the that. next note. It yes. tells you the name. We, we can, oh, Paul says the name. Uh, the Wicked Bible, only 20 copies exist. This is important because uh, we assume sometimes every time you see an alternate uh, reading that uh, it has significance. It could just be a, a mistake. And uh, often they give the example of that. Um, someone points out privately, most women in Europe could not read. So there are women who could, and they would lead the women in the davening. Correct, I mentioned that. The significant point, however, is that they would have, we have references to the base kinesis of the Nushin, that um, if you recall during the whole dispute over women's prayer groups, so one of the arguments was that if the uh, the women are not davening in the shul, they lose to Fila Betzibor and they're not with the minion. Uh, that didn't seem to be an issue years ago when they assumed that the women, there's no union of Tevil Betzibor for women. So if the women want to, there's no criticism in any of the earlier literature that the women getting together to do that. And my, for example, my daughter was at um, uh, seminary for two years. They, they had like women's tefillah, let's say you would have sometimes. They never said, they never thought, made it. And I don't know of any seminaries where they make a big deal that you have to go to daven with a minion. The girls daven together with the girls. They don't make it that you have to go to a minion all the time to feel with Sibor. But during the dispute of the women's prayer groups, all of a sudden we see they're talking about the fact that the women are missing to feel with Sibor. When I have to tell you until the 19, was it 1980s, I've never seen any source that talks about how it's important for women to get to feel with Sibor. So if you want to be a historian, like, Jacob Katz's model, you would argue, just like he was arguing about uh, that uh, we saw with the, the Hamburg, the rabbis in Ego de Verabis, you'd say, well, you know, it, could it be that the reason now the rabbis are stressing the women need to fill up at Seabor, and we never heard of this before that, is precisely because just like they used to fight against the reformers, now they're fighting against these more liberal orthodox. And in order to uh, put a stop to this, which they believe is inappropriate, Therefore, they start stressing something that never before in history, to my knowledge, had anyone ever mentioned that there's an Indian of a woman coming to Tefillah B'Tzibur. I already told you that in Jerba, other than uh, hearing uh, um, Megillah Sester, uh, 
uh, there's no such concept of the women going to show uh, and even going, they don't even go to the show. They sit outside the show when you read it for them. So I don't know. For, as a historian, I'd be very curious to probe this further. Why all of a sudden is there an Indian for women for Tfila Betsibor? And I, it's definitely not a coincidence that it's in response to um, the uh, women's prayer groups, which could be criticized for all sorts of good reasons. But uh, are these homochic arguments or are these sort of um, metahochic arguments? Ah, we see, thank you, Mike, that uh, the PhD of um, Rebitson, because she is, she's a Rebitson and she runs a, a girls' school. Her PhD dissertation, you can see it online. There you go. Um, well, uh, Rabbi Kelman says it's scary to think a Dole term may not be telling the truth. Uh, yeah. It's a uh, it's an issue with the Magen Avraham. Magen Avraham actually cites this uh, halacha that uh, you can uh, alter the truth, um, and it makes sense. You can make the you can see the argument. If I can alter the truth so that someone's not offended, I can. Why can't I alter the truth so that someone uh, properly serves Hashem? Uh, I mean, you can make that argument. Uh, again, you've, those who've seen my book know the back and forth. Um, Someone asked, what's the spelling and meaning of Sfirish Chayas' name? The name is Chet Yud Vav Saf. Uh, is it Chayas son like Isaac or Chayot? Uh, it's in, in Hebrew, they, now they call it Chayot. It's Chayas. Uh, I, we have the name before him as well. I don't know. Maybe it's from Chaya. We know, name, maybe named after a woman. I have to look. I can't remember what uh, Hutner David or Hershkovitz says about the name. We have examples. For example, the Marsha, Adels. That's after his, his mother, his grandmother, his mother. And we have a number of examples like that. So maybe. Um... Yes, thank you, Hyman. Yeah, that's what we said. Uh, so then why, if it's if Hyman says correctly, that's a Torah prohibition to say that the uh, Durabonans Daraisa, what is the Chasm Sulfur? How I mean, how could the people like Ravad Yosef say otherwise? Because uh, um, because here you're doing it not to misrepresent the Torah, here you're doing it to keep people in the fold. I guess that's the argument they could uh, um they don't see this as Zia Torah. They see this as um as uh, the masses. The masses are not entitled to all the information because they're the masses. You can't lie to a Tamil Chacham. You can't lie in a Shear. But when you're trying to keep the masses on the straight and narrow, you can. Sounds a little bit like the Catholic Church that they were trying to keep people ignorant. It, well, they were. In fact, they, 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 they refused to allow translations of, uh, of even the Kids of Shulchan Aruch. What Rabbi Yellen cites there from Rabbi Dessler, I cite that in my book as well, that uh, truth is truth. What's truth is, is what keeps you in line with uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's, that's truth. Uh, that's a higher truth. Uh, so there you go. Um, uh, yes, um, let me go quickly. There are alternate truths. That's exactly. There's truth and there's truth. The truth of capital T, truth of the small t, I don't know which is with, but uh, the, the ultimate truth is to be in line with God and to follow halacha. The other truth is a, is a lesser truth that can be dispensed with for certain people, just like our children. Do we always tell our children the truth? No, uh, we want them to do the right thing. Uh, Please take a look at my book. You'll see all the different sources. There's Gemaras that speak about this. Uh, it's, I, I think this is a dispute that goes back to the days of the Gemara, and it goes through the Rishonim. Uh, we're uncomfortable with it today because uh, we believe in um, that all the facts should be out there and that we don't believe in covering things up, but um, there's a whole tradition of this. Uh, Uh, Mike says, just as a tradition to overemphasize some prohibitions, isn't the converse also true? Not to tell women about some prohibitions, we're pretty sure they won't keep, it's not just women. The Gemara says this. Just like it's a mitzvah to say that what they will listen to, it's a mitzvah not to say what they won't listen to. A rabbi who knows his community is not going to follow something, is not supposed to get up and tell them that. We discussed this in the first, uh, when I dealt with my latest book. When you're learning in Shulchan Aruch, you're not supposed to skip, but you're not supposed to tell people something. If um, you're not in the most observant community and everyone came and they brought their baby carriages and then you get a note that the, the, you get a message that the Arab is down. The psak as given by big rabbis is you're not supposed to get up and you're not supposed to announce the Arab's down because uh, the people are still going to push the carriages and now they're doing it amazing. 
they say you're, you're not supposed to make a public announcement. You tell a few people who you know are pious and then listen to. Every rabbi knows this, and this is not a modern thing. This goes back to the Gemara. Better that they're shogging than they're amazing. Do not tell people about things if you know they're not going to listen. So that's Talmudic. Um, Harvey says it appears that rabbis are treating us like children. No, not us. We're here learning on Monday night. We're part of the elites. We get all the information. But the, 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 there's a distinction between the Hamon Am. The rabbis distinguish between the Hamon Am. Look, all, everyone agrees the rabbis distinguish between the Hamon Am and the elites. Some achronim hold that uh, you can even um, distort things for the Hamonam, but everyone knows. The Gemara already says that the Hamonam doesn't get all the information. There's a halacha of Einmorin King. We have certain halacha that we can't tell the Hamonam because they can't handle it. Like the movie says, they can't handle the truth. And uh, every rabbi knows this also. When you get up and give a sermon, there's certain things you say. And certain things you don't say. If you have a small shear, your five best Talmudim, you'll speak about more complicated matters because that's self-selected. People come, but when you're giving a sermon and everyone's sitting there, you don't raise all sorts of problematic issues. Some people will be troubling for them. They won't, they won't grasp it. Uh, that's that's um, the Rambam explicitly dis distinguishes between those who are able to be let into certain truths and everyone else who's not. The, and this is based on the Gemara. We're not allowed to teach Maisa Merkava to a, a group. Why not? Just individuals, because not everyone is able, not everyone is deserving of the truths. I know this sounds very elitist, but that's, that's our tradition, that there are certain things that not everyone is. Um, okay, about the Chaim Moser and electricity, I just, uh, we've gone along far. Yes, so Ferdinand, uh, Ferdinand, oh, Shopik, okay, someone from my town. So the violinist works as well as Geiger. Um, but I think, I think in the 19th century that uh, they didn't use violinists. I think they used Geiger because that's the references that I seem to be that I found to Geiger. I could be wrong on that, but uh, uh, you're a native German speaker, not me. And uh, thank you for, for this quickly. Uh, Chaim says he doesn't believe that Chaim Ozer is the one who refused to give a reason for the issue of electricity. He was known for using a, a light bulb for Avdala to emphasize it was actually Aish. Um, yeah, you're right. He, he did say that, um, Avdala. So I'm not sure. There's definitely one. I, I'll find it for next week. Um, and finally, the name is not Evan Shushan. It's Evan Shoshan. Correct. That's right. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. I, we can go on. Uh, I'll end with Mel because we began with Mel. Um, the point about Theo but Seabor is not that it is required, is that Theo but Seabor is more valuable than participation by women in the service. Uh, are you saying, Mel, that Theo but Seabor is more valuable to women than, than women by themselves? Because I never saw anyone ever mention this in any of the Gemara, in the Rishonim, or anywhere, that uh, there's, a, there's an idea that a woman uh, should go to Shul because uh, sh there's, a, there's, a, there's a kiyum of Theo but Seabor. I'm not saying no, that's not true. But if they want to do something better, then that's what they should do. Rather than yeah, but who says it's better? No, no, but who says it's better? Maybe it's, it's better, better for it's better for a woman, let's say, who feels she gets kavana and feels that's necessary. But let's say you have a woman who feels maybe otherwise. In other words, there's no uh, there's no chiyuv. So, but if you recall, during the women's prayer groups, this was brought in to say why the women shouldn't do this. And I remember at the time, I was a youngster at that time, I remember thinking, well, then how come all the girls' schools, uh, they do davening, they don't bring them every morning to daven with the, you know, in the local shul, they do their little davening in the, in the base alcove. Uh, so they obviously don't think that there's, there's, at least I don't think they think that there's really such an important inyan. They don't want women's prayer groups. Women's prayer groups are dangerous. They can lead to feelings of egalitarianism. They can lead to a breakdown of tradition, all sorts of reasons, which I get. And uh, I understand why. I just am pointing to the fact that that was one of, I think it might've been Roshachter who, pointed, who mentioned this the whole, about Philo at Seabor. I just found it unusual that that's the stress. Um, as I said, in Jerba, they all daven, but they don't feel that it's important to go to the show. The women can get together and do their davening, but it's not women's prayer group there because a women's prayer group was a feminist innovation uh, with consciously feminist. When the women in Jerba, 
And God willing, I'm going to Jerba the day after Shavuos, but I'll give you something else. Five students, because of me, five Princeton students are going to Jerba in two weeks for the Lag Bomer celebration. Um, my daughter and uh, four others, if you can believe it, and Princeton University is funding it. So that should be a lot of fun. But um, the point is that the women there, they're, they're just doing it because that's their tradition. So I get it. I understand perfectly well. But the issue is when Rav Shechter writes, there were two oppo uh, oppositions to it. You had first the statement that came out from the five Rosh Yeshiva. That was like a more of a Das Torah, a basic statement explaining this is forbidden. Rav Shechter felt like he had to give a halachic argument. And he writes a long essay, Tzilch uh, Be'ichvei and uh, there he tries to argue halachically. And the problem, and I think this is what Chaim Ozer was speaking about with the Shlita, once you start arguing halachically, then you can challenge it. And if you recall back three decades ago, people then started challenging. And then you say, well, Shechter says this, but this is, it's, it's weak here. Then all of a sudden, since it's, you know, maybe well, not all of his arguments are so uh, slam dunk, then it's a machokas. You have, let's say, Rabbi Avi Weiss here near of Shechter, now it's a machokas. And then you could say, if this is the best Rosh Hector can come up with, then um, maybe there is room for leniency. That's why Rav Chaim Ozer, I think, would have said, if he was around, we don't give reasons why the women's prayer group is not correct. We understand that it's not correct, not for halachic reasons necessarily. That's why the Rav, by the way, didn't sign the letter because the Rav opposed it, but the Rav said it's not a halachic argument and he didn't want to sign the letter of the Rosh Yeshiva that said it's usher. The Rav was opposed to it. Because you can be opposed to something, you think, think that something is going to lead to all sorts of bad results without actually being able to point to a simon in the Shulchan Aruch. We're not halachocentric in the way that, uh, you know, Abraham and Rashi Heschel attacked the Orthodox. There's plenty of things we do because it's the, the Masora, it's the tradition, etc. That's how I see it. I, I know I'm more conservative with a small C on this than many of the listeners, but what can you do? Uh, it's, uh, we all have freedom of speech, freedom of thought. So uh, sometimes I'm more conservative. Okay, we'll end here. Thank you very much for a very... Um, you know, insightful questions, you know, nice debate going on here, a lot of fun. Rabbi. That, they, that's why, by the way, when I read the OU reason why you can't have women rabbis, I became much more in favor of women rabbis. <laughs> if that paper was the best that they could do, that none of us can articulate a reason why it's us, but we all know it's us, or that didn't do it for me. So uh, anyways, uh, that's, I'm not here to discuss, but th that's exactly what you say. By the way, the reason I would think that you would say a woman should dove with a minion, which is something I've always encouraged, by the way, women's, not, not the, necessarily instead of women's prayer group, whatever, but because we believe Tfilot are nishma'ot better. When you dove with a minion, HaKadosh Baruch hears you. Take Rosh Salavetri, explain the Yaki, the Tzibur. There's a totally different understanding of our relationship to God when I dove as an individual and when I dove as part of a community and God made a covenant with the community our tefillot are heard much more so I think that's the reason um I or anybody would encourage women done with tefillot not to hear barhu and say yesh me rabbi that's minor it's the idea of dubbing with the minion that's important I would agree uh, that again, today, I'm not getting the argument I, I, no, I, I would agree with you maybe, today today the shul serves that function for men and women but for hundreds of years that was like a yeah, yeah, yeah. everything right. Women didn't uh, the Magan Ram says the woman says the modani, and that's you know that's how they today. Up. If a women don't go to Shul Shah this morning, they're at home. Uh, what do they read? Reading the newspaper. So it's right. definitely you're losing, you know. But Jerba is right. a different place. Yeah. yeah, but yes, but it is uh I think all of us find it disconcerting at, about the idea that uh you know a great Torah scholar may not be telling the truth for us in the modern Orthodox community, that's very troubling because it calls into question so much of what we hear when they make pronouncements. Um, but, but yes, I agree. Um, being in Rav Shechter's share and everything, yeah, they, they, these people were totally MF. And Rav Shechter very often stressed the idea that saying it, Dean de Rabbanan, is it the right is in Isra Baltosi, who quote the Rambam all the time. And I heard that from him many, many times. And that's uh, the brisker tradition, to be totally honest. But as you say, it's not everybody's tradition. Nunu, like you say, lots of food for thought and uh, not everything that has happened in our tradition makes us, us comfortable and i'm honest enough to admit it you know what what can what can we do anyways all right thank you very much everybody tomorrow we'll learn about the dumb of torah in early judaism marcus simpson we're going to go back 2000 years to, to have torah developed that's at 2 p.m 
um, um, Eastern time, 1 p.m. Central time in Chicago, where she's based. And then tomorrow night, like I said at the beginning, 8.30, uh, Michelle Chesner, the librarian of of uh, at Columbia University, we we'll speaking on the, about books and Jewish history development of the book. I think I personally, I, I was very fascinated when I was first heard about her. So that's tomorrow night at eight thirty, and we look forward to seeing you uh, all during the week. And as always, please invite a friend and uh, watch out for the emails. I think I sent them in earlier with all the weekly, um, you know, programs. And we look forward to learning with you and uh, and Lila to everybody. And thank you very much. Always interested to hear comments, and nobody has to agree with anything I say. I don't even always agree with everything I say. So, uh, you know, sometimes I change my mind. I'm not sure, but uh, whatever. Okay. Lila Tov, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have to go check the score in the Yankee game. I didn't check recently. Okay. I'm really chasing the Yankees. All right. All right. Good down night. One run. I'm sorry? Jays are down one run. Oh, Jays are down one run. There you go. Okay. All right, what can you do? But I think the, the Leafs are winning, no? Yeah, big time. The Leafs are winning. Okay, hockey. But uh, new Toronto winning four games, that's nearly an impossibility. All right, Lila, let's everybody.